I want to, to uh, introduce our next speaker and our last speaker for this whole First World Sepsis Congress, which is Anne Parker. Anne is instructor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is currently studying clinical, uh, clinical investigation in, uh, in John Hopkins uh, uh, about uh, post-intensive care syndrome, and this is exactly what she is going to tell us about. Hi, Anne. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much. It's such an honor to be included in the, in the speaker panel. Um, so I'll keep this fairly brief. I know um, we might be a little bit over time, and, and I'm the last speaker, but um, this is uh, quite an honor, so thank you. Um, so I'll be talking today about ICU-related post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. So, and this has been covered previously, but just to summarize, as the population ages, more and more people are requiring critical care at some point during their lifetime. And at the same time, we've gotten better at taking care of people who are critically ill, such as people with sepsis. And so mortality for these folks is decreasing. And so we have this increasing pool of ICU survivors who are developing a number of long-term sequelae. Uh, just as Dr. Ely mentioned in his talk, we refer to this as the post-intensive care syndrome. And this constellation of symptoms includes impairments in mental health, cognitive impairments, as well as physical impairments. And we know that these issues can last for more than five years after people with sepsis and other critical illness leave the ICU, and that these issues are associated with a worse quality of life. And so I'll be focusing on specifically post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. So I think just to summarize what PTSD is and how we actually diagnose PTSD and look at PTSD symptoms, if we look at the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, we see that in order for a person to be diagnosed with PTSD, they have to experience a severe life stress. So this needs to be an actual or threatened death or serious injury. And this has to be associated with an intense fear as well as chronic symptoms that I'll get more into in just a moment. And these symptoms need to last for over a month, and they need to cause significant stress or impairment in daily functioning. So these symptoms include symptoms of intrusion, which might be intrusive thoughts or recollections, bad dreams, flashbacks to the event, as well as avoidance of situations or themes that remind the individual of the event as well as negative alterations in cognition and mood, so uh, depressive symptoms, as well as increased arousal, so difficulty sleeping, having trouble concentrating. And so in order to summarize the prevalence and the risk factors for developing PTSD symptoms in uh, folks with critical illness, such as sepsis, we did a meta-analysis, a systematic review and meta-analysis to answer this question. And so we looked at PTSD studies in ICU survivors, and these included individuals with sepsis. So we looked at 40 studies on 36 unique cohorts of patients. So the total number of patients in the systematic review was over 4,000. These studies looked at patients who had been discharged from the ICU anywhere from one month ago to the three years. And we excluded studies that focused just on very specific patient populations. We wanted to get a sense for the PTSD symptom prevalence and risk factors for all comers to the ICU. Notably, 12 of the 40 studies that we looked at excluded patients that had a history of pre-existing psychopathology. So they excluded patients who had pre-existing anxiety or depression. And the remainder of the studies did not have that criteria. So we performed a meta-analysis to look at the pooled prevalence of PTSD symptoms among ICU survivors. We decided to use the studies uh, with the most commonly implemented instrument for assessing PTSD symptoms. And so this happened to be the impact of event scale. And this was chosen mostly because of the number of studies that we would need for the meta-analysis and this being the most common instrument used. And one of the most common cutoff scores used among these studies was a 35, a score of 35 on the impact of event scale. Notably, there were a number of different measures used to assess PTSD symptoms in each of these studies. And so this was just one of the instruments used. So if we looked at 
studies that included follow-up from one to six months after the ICU. We found six studies looking at this time point and using the IES or impact of event scale. And the total number of patients among these studies was 450. And what we found was that one in four patients develop substantial PTSD symptoms during this time period following their ICU stay. If we looked at the seven to 12 month time period, we saw that almost one in five patients up to a year out, up to a year after discharge from the ICU had substantial PTSD symptoms. If we looked at a couple of studies that included specifically a clinician diagnosis of PTSD, so this was a clinician interview to diagnose PTSD symptoms, the range was 10 to 32 percent prevalence. So the take-home message here is that PTSD symptoms are remarkably common with almost one in five patients having substantial PTSD symptoms that persist to a year after ICU discharge. And so looking at some of the risk factors for PTSD symptoms, we looked at some of the risk factors that patients may have had coming into the ICU, so they're pre-existing risk factors. And one of those appears to be pre-existing psychopathology. So again, pre-existing anxiety, depression. We saw that in five of nine studies where there was a positive association with having had more anxiety or depression before the ICU and then subsequently developing new PTSD symptoms upon leaving the ICU. Some of the risk factors associated with the ICU stay itself, uh, there was a possible association with benzodiazepine exposure, so medications like Ativan, Versed, Midazolam. And then another very consistent risk factor was this concept of early post-ICU memories of frightening ICU experiences. And so some of these memories, for example, were things like seeing blood pouring down the walls, thinking that a patient, uh, thinking that they were being stabbed or assaulted when in fact maybe they were having a chest tube placed, feeling that they were being smothered when in fact they had an endotracheal tube in to be on a breathing machine, um, thinking that the nurses and the doctors were teaming up against them in some way. And so these were very distressing memories for the patients, and this was a theme that came up across many studies and seemed to have a consistent positive association with developing PTSD symptoms. Notably, and I think this goes very much in line with Dr. Ely's talk, the ICU variables that were not associated with development of PTSD, I think, can seem counterintuitive. So basically having patients awake more during their ICU stay did not seem to cause more PTSD symptoms. And so the thought was many years ago that having patients awake and knowing that all of these things were happening to them may be scary and may lead to the development of more distressing symptoms after they leave the ICU. But what, in fact, we found from the systematic review is that just the opposite was true that if patients were allowed to be awake with a spontaneous awakening trial, spontaneous breathing trial, if they had lighter sedation as opposed to deeper sedation, or if their sedation strategy was really one that focused more on pain, that these individuals did not develop more PTSD symptoms. Similarly, other ICU variables that were not associated with PTSD were older age, reason for admission to the ICU, severity of illness, or ICU length of stay. And so the take-home message here is that the traditional risk factors that we think of when we consider post-ICU physical impairments are not necessarily the same factors that are associated with worse psychological outcomes. And so we may miss the boat if we focus on just the most uh, severely ill patients in terms of their Apache score, for example, or the patients that had the longest length of stay in the ICU, that really these might not be the factors that are contributing to the development of PTSD symptoms down the line. So in summary, the take-home messages are that at six months, one in four ICU survivors had substantial PTSD symptoms. And the one year, at the one-year mark, one in five patients had substantial PTSD symptoms. So these numbers are in line with what we see for people that have been exposed to war or combat or 
a, a traumatic event like the World Trade Center attacks, these prevalence numbers are actually quite in line with what we've seen. Risk factors include pre-ICU, anxiety, depression, as well as these memories of frightening things happening during the ICU stay. Decreased sedation does not seem to be associated with more PTSD symptoms, so all of the benefits that we see from getting people up and moving and having them awake are not predisposing them to then having more PTSD symptoms. So all the more reason to have our patients awake and moving as much as possible. And traditional risk factors for physical impairment are not the same risk factors that seem to be associated with PTSD symptoms. So I welcome any comments, questions. This is my email address. And then I'm also a member of the OASIS research group at Johns Hopkins, which is founded and directed by Dr. Dale Needham. And I've put our web link there for our site as well. There are some great videos that are linked on that site. Um, if you'd like to hear some patient testimonials, experiences, uh, it's a great resource. Thanks, Anne, for this uh, very nice presentation. We have a question for you here. Sure. Um, Giuseppe is uh, saying that most published studies related to follow-up experience held in a 6 to, tw uh, to 12 months period after hospital discharge, while PTSD is to be deal with uh, as early as at discharge time. And he wants you to comment uh, a little bit more on this. Okay. Sure. I think if I'm understanding the question, um, it's basically why are we kind of waiting so long to assess symptoms and why aren't we really trying to figure out what's going on with patients sooner and intervene earlier? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, yes, exactly. I think that's a great point. Um, you know, one notable thing in order to, if you recall the slide on diagnosing PTSD, patients really need to have symptoms for at least a month after the ICU stay in order for uh, a diagnosis of PTSD or this to be substantial symptoms. That being said, I completely agree that we should be looking at ways to intervene in the ICU immediately after the ICU and ongoing as patients transition back to the community to try to prevent and address these symptoms. Uh, the one thing that I'm sure you're familiar with is a concept called the ICU diary, uh, which is pretty uh, common practice in Europe, but here in the United States, it's not something that we typically use. And I think this is potentially a great way to uh, allow patients to begin processing their ICU stay really from, you know, the moment that they're awake and able to interact. But I completely agree, and this is a great point, that early intervention is is key in most things that we're talking about here. Yeah, I have another question for you. Is that uh, it, it's a sort of a scary thing to know that what we do in the ICU, this frightening ICU experiences, uh, is the only factor that you find actually that it's in our field that it, it's related to PTSD. Uh, what can we do? when? I mean, we are still uh, intubating patients and we are still putting uh, uh, enteral tubes. So, what can we do to? prevent this or to, to make this experience less uh, frightening? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I think some of the keys are identifying people who may be at risk for any number of reasons to be more likely to develop PTSD symptoms. So, you know, individuals who have some pre-existing anxiety or depression and really making sure that we target those individuals among other risk factors, you know, people with other risk factors that may predispose them to be sure that we're intervening as early as possible. I think what's interesting about this uh, concept of the frightening memories is these memories seem to have a delirious component to them. So, you know, it's, it's memories, it's sort of a clouding of what actually happened in the ICU and the patient's interpretation and processing of that memory in a way that's not completely intact with reality. Uh, and so there is some thought that uh, intervening in a way that allows patients to process these memories more in real time and with, with more intact reality may prevent these sort of delirious memories down the line that may precipitate PTSD symptoms.
Uh, well, very well. And uh, I left a question, uh, uh, and we are in the low and middle income countries, just uh, improving our process of care, our early recognition, uh, treating adequately these patients. And uh, I think that we are very far from uh, uh, caring that this patient properly after discharge, mostly in the public system where uh, this kind of support is almost uh, non-existent at all. What can we do to uh, stimulate people in these settings uh, to to see the importance, the relevance of uh, PTSD, and uh, how can we deal with this? Um, so, so I think you're asking how we can deal with uh, sort of bringing this to attention in, in lower income countries where we yes, exactly, countries. yes, because yeah, because we are focusing our attention now in the in the and all the process in the hospital, but we are not taking care of this patient properly after discharge, yeah. mostly in the public system, I think. You know, I think just as we've seen in terms of the uh, early mobility and having people awake in the ICU is that it does take to some degree, kind of a, a culture change within the ICU setting where we start emphasizing from the moment patients, you know, hit the ICU door that we're thinking about their recovery and not just their survival. And that can be, a, you know, a very challenging concept to take hold, but I, I think that's probably at the heart of, of how to prevent a lot of these things that we see uh, in terms of PICs when patients leave the ICU. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anne, for this very nice talk.